Now that I consider it, I realize that by choosing that style, you really did make it so that this book will be truly readable by everyone. And as you mentioned, this is an important topic to regular people because almost everyone is going to, at some time or the other, face the problem of pain, if not themselves, for a loved one. So I want to start by reading a brief quote from your book that I think sort of sums up where I hope we're going to go today. You said, and this was in the preface, you said, the study of pain, both normal and abnormal, is intrinsic to the scientific quest to understand the workings of the brain. And since that's what this show is about, I really appreciated that. I think you really did bring that out well in the book. And you also said that pain is a brain function. In looking at that, would you say that that is something that it's taken people time to really appreciate that pain is in the brain? Well, I mean, this is, uh, this is the essence of it. Um, as I, I said before, I'm a neuroscientist. I started my career from medicine, but essentially I see myself as a neuroscientist and somebody who's been trying to find out how the brain works. And I'll tell you something which is, to me anyway, is important and interesting, and this is how I got there. When I was in medical school, medical school studying psychiatric patients, and that's the thing that really got me the most. I mean, that was back in the 1960s, so it's a long time ago. But I was completely taken up by seeing and talking to people with severe psychosis. These are the people who look perfectly normal. You wouldn't know anything else except that when they start talking, or, or sometimes they can't talk very much, and they have a life, a complete life of their own. Their brain has gone wrong, and then they, um, they live in an unreal world. Or well, they do things, so they have motivations and rituals and things which are we I mean, they are the people who are the deep psychiatric patients, the ones that are usually end up in institutions. And I thought that it was amazing how little we knew about how the brain works and how much our entire existence, I mean, you can have a, a liver that doesn't work very well and you're still yourself. But if your brain starts not working very well, you cease to be yourself. You become something else. And sometimes you're not even aware of it. So that's how I decided, well, I have to find out more how the brain works. And this is how I became a neuroscientist. And I've been trying ever since. Now, pain is, of course, one of the functions of the brain. I don't think that anybody would argue anything contrary to that. There is a chapter in the book where I describe how if you manipulate parts of the brain, you can eliminate pain completely. And I mentioned in particular frontal lobotomy. I think you may have seen that. So it is a brain function. And also because it's so complex, pain is not just a sensory process, it's an emotional one. It has very important cognitive elements. The thing that makes us suffer is not the physical part of pain, but the emotional and the cognitive part of pain. So it is really um, almost wonderful example of brain function. So pain is about neuroscience, and neuroscience includes pain, for sure. Most of the best books that I've read, especially for people outside the field, are ones that put their work into the historical perspective in the way that you did. So could you give us some historical background of the study of pain? It goes, not surprisingly, all the way back to the Greeks. I was very impressed from early on in my scientific life that everybody knows that we have five senses. And if you ask any child at school, they will tell you immediately, you know, vision, hearing, touch, uh, taste, and smell. Pain is not in that, as you see. So one of the things that makes us strongest feelings that we have in relation with the outside world, which is pain, is not one of the five senses. So that also triggered my interest in finding out how this thing came about. And of course, the five senses is something that comes from the work of Aristotle a long, long time ago, more than 2,000 years ago. And he is the one responsible for the five senses. And he thought that pain was not the sense, but what he called a passion of the soul, an emotion. So there were two contraries, which he called pleasure and pain. And every sensory process that we have, every perception, every aspect of our life could go either way, could be pleasurable or painful. So the pleasure and pain were not senses. They were the emotions that color every aspect of our life which, of course, you can develop into all sorts of philosophical arguments, has kind of stayed with us right to today. And even in modern neuroscience, there is still some argument as to whether pain is actually a sensation, like vision or hearing or touch, any of the others, or whether it is something which is not a sensory process, but an emotional, cognitive element that colors what we do, either positively in the case of pleasure or negatively in the case of pain. 
this history has been going on for more than 2,000 years and is still unresolved. And there are people, modern scientists, who will deny that pain is a sensory process like vision, say. And that has importance when we study the mechanisms because the approach that we will follow is completely different. If you think about vision, when we have, of course, the sensors in the retina and we have pathways through the brain and we have a piece of the cortex in the visual cortex and all of the way we study the process of visual perception is following that visual path. Now, whether pain has something like that or not is also controversial because if it's not a sensation, then we shouldn't have it. Why do we need to have a pain pathway or pain-specific elements within our brain if it's not a sense like vision or hearing? So all of this historical background has a lot of relevance to the way in which we study the neuroscience of pain. Because the questions you ask change and what you look for changes. If you're taking Aristotle's approach, then you're not going to look for pain sensors since in that approach they wouldn't exist. Of course. What this approach implies is that if you have an abnormal or excessive or whatever you want to call it, stimulation of a normal sensory pathway, then it would be a painful event. So you didn't need to have a specific pain pathway, you will just be the result of an abnormal activation of an existing sensory pathway from another method. Whereas if you think of pain as having some sensory components, and I think that the truth is somewhere in between. Pain does have an important sensory component, but it also has added emotional and cognitive elements. So there are, in fact, some elements of a pain pathway in the brain. I know we can't spend a lot of time on the history, but I thought we might touch on Descartes briefly because usually a lot of us tend to focus on what he got wrong and not give him credit for what he got right. Could you talk a little bit about why what he wrote about pain is so important? Well, I think he got a lot of things right. And if you think that he did that in the 17th century, it's very remarkable, particularly since it was all what you may call a thought process. There was no experimental evidence or anything that could be proven. If it's all what these people were doing is to sit down and write what they, how they thought the brain worked not necessarily because they did any experimental work about it. So, and he got a lot of things right. And what he was saying, and this is one of the reasons why he's also being criticized, what he was saying is that pain is an alarm system, that if you have any kind of injury, and it's this famous picture of a little boy with a foot close to a fire or something, if you get this kind of injury or injury-producing stimulus, then there would be a transmission of events from that point in the skin or in that part of the body that is being injured all the way up to the brain. And there, there would be a reflection, as he put it. He thought it was all done with mirrors, which was the technology of his time. There would be a reflection of this information into the brain, and then a signal would come from the brain down to the nerves to move the muscles so that will take that limb away from the injury. And because of this mirror system of activity that he described, he called that a reflex. The process is like reflecting in a mirror. And that word still remains to our days. We call reflexes the movements, the automatic movements that we make in response to an injury or to any stimulus. It's a reflex. So all of that is right. Now, he thought that the whole thing would happen in the pineal gland, but that's a different story because he was a very well-organized man, that's right in the middle of the brain. So he thought that everything will happen in the middle of the brain. And that's not right. But still, the idea that we have sensory messages going from the external parts of our body to the brain, and that our response is elaborated inside the brain and goes on the other way, from the brain to the muscles and produce an action, that's all perfectly correct, is what we call the reflex activity. And he was perfectly right on all of that. Now, the problem with pain is that this only works for one kind of pain. This pain of, that works as an alarm system, the very acute pain that makes us move our limb if we touch something hot or if we step on a pin or something like this. And it doesn't work very well, that kind of model, for clinically relevant pain, for chronic pain, pain produced by disease, by, or, or even, even worse, for neuropathic pain, pain produced by neurological disease. So the thing about Descartes is not that he was wrong, is that his models and schemes of how pain works are incomplete. They only deal with one aspect of pain, which is the acute alarm-related protective pain. 